This episode is brought to you by Out of the Sandbox. They make some incredible Shopify themes. And fun little fact here, if you purchase our course, Dropship Breakthrough, we actually give you an Out of the Sandbox theme. We give you Superstore because we believe that is one of the best themes on the market. So we've actually teamed up with Out of the Sandbox to get a special discount for you if you are in the market for a new theme. So head to dropshipbreakthrough.com forward slash Superstore. And be sure to use the code DROPSHIP at checkout to save on your next theme purchase. Welcome to the Dropship Podcast, where you'll learn how to build and grow a high-ticket dropshipping business and hear stories from successful e-commerce entrepreneurs. Let's kick this thing off. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Dropship Podcast. Uh, This is a Freedom Friday episode where we talk to successful dropshipping entrepreneurs about their journey and today it is the all aussie connection we've got two fantastic australians on on with me and i've got to say it's very refreshing to not have anybody from the united states on the podcast uh, i think it's a first it's probably a first for a dropshipping podcast as well to actually have australians on it uh, i'm pretty excited and today i'm joined by tris coffin and blake sterling fellas how are we going really good thanks john really good looking forward to the podcast yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited. It's nice to hear Australian accents. And um, yeah, so guys, you both started dropshipping in, in 2019. So, you know, not uh, been going for a few years now, but not not a super long time. Uh, and I'm curious, I, I know a little bit, I mean, we've obviously known each other since around uh, 2019. Um, and I kind of know a little bit of your backstories, uh, of course, but I'm curious to know, as always, like how did you guys find dropshipping, high ticket dropshipping in particular, and, and what was your sort of motivation for getting started with dropshipping back at that point? So I was, so it was around the Christmas period, 2018, um, obviously had, you know, the normal holiday period off and I was just, well, for one, I was bored and two, I was like, I'm, I need to, like, I want to save for a house and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, build my family up and do well. So I was looking at opportunities. What could I do? I was actually halfway going down the path of becoming an Uber driver, <laughs> had all my applications done. And then I was looking at how much you actually make once you factor everything in. I was like, this is, this is ridiculous. I'm not doing this. So that's where I went, okay, what else can I do? Went down the rabbit hole of online businesses and what can I do that doesn't suck up all my time? Came across drop shipping and was sold the whole thing of like, do this, you'll make a million dollars. It'll be great. So that's kind of how I fell into it. <laughs> nice. And did you, what was your, what was your background before then? Did you like have any background with online business or anything like that, Tris? None whatsoever. No. So um, my background is uh, scientific. So I'm a marine scientist by qualification. Um, so very sort of Excel spreadsheets, all that kind of stuff. Um, had no idea about anything to do with websites. So <laughs> it's very much starting from basics. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. How about you, Blake? Where did, where did you come from? Um, so I I actually got started um, with dropshipping way back in around 20, it must have been 2016. I bought the dropship lifestyle course and proceeded to do absolutely nothing with it for about three or four years. I think I just bought it and kind of looked into it a little bit in terms of what the 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 ideas behind it because the the overarching idea behind um what dropshipping was appealed to me um i've got a copywriting and marketing background so i was looking to kind of leverage those skills into something that i could um you know build my wealth you know increase my my sort of time freedom with as well and spend more time with the kids and things like that so yeah again bought dropship lifestyle did nothing with it um, and then it wasn't until like 2018 or sort of 2019, I, I must have seen something come up in like a in my Facebook feed or something like that, and um, went, oh, that's right, I've got this course like hiding in a folder on my laptop somewhere. So kind of jumped back to in, jumped back into it, um, and then um, kind of went from went from there and 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 became a little bit more committed with it beyond that point, but. I already had um, some e-commerce experience. I'd sort of, um, I'd had an e- eBay store for years, like a good decade or so. You know, I went from importing and selling Japanese car parts to to toys to 
um, pajamas and all this different sort of stuff. So I had a bit of experience um, in the e-commerce niche, but yeah, again, when it sort of came to like, but just nothing serious. It was more of just like a little side thing, bringing a, a bit of extra cash to to pay bills, but it was never anything more than that. Um, and then again, you know, once I sort of my my um, excitement about sort of drop shipping was re sparked in 2018, 2019. Um, that's when I really took it serious and dove straight in. Yeah, I was cool. trying to find the first. I was trying to find the first um, Facebook message that you sent me from back then. I'm pretty sure you reached out to me on one of the Facebook pages and like, oh, let's <laughs> let's catch up and discuss and try and work together and all that kind of stuff. Could, couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> and nice. And so, Blake, do you remember, um, like, what when you were sort of, you know, thinking back when you, I mean, you bought that, like you said, you bought that course in 2016 and you're thinking about doing something to increase your wealth, get more time. Do you remember why you ended up on high ticket drop shipping? Like, because you've, you've got a background with online business with your yeah. marketing and copywriting. So you probably, I would have assumed at that point, knew about a lot of other kind of things you could do, you know, online. What what sort of sold you on high ticket drop shipping, do you think? I think it was just, it, it was a couple of things. I, I think it was, and, and we all know this from sort of, you know, having been in this kind of world now for quite a while, but, you know, when you sort of first start investigating high ticket drop shipping, a lot of the marketing out there is 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 how easy it is and how much money you can make. And and even though I've got a background, you know, in in marketing, and you know, a lot of my copy is written around making things seem simple and easy too. Uh, I I kind of got caught by that. It it was like the sort of one thing was the the money side of it, but the I think the bigger thing for me though was more of that. That sort of freedom aspect to it that if i could get one or two of these businesses running and, and running well that i could eventually you know quit the nine to five and and um you know again i've got two young kids so i've got a young family and basically spend more time with the family so that was i think the greater appeal to me more than the money but you know the the, the two obviously marry together you know in the middle there because you've got to you know you can't have one without the other um so I think that was the big sort of appeal to me and and um, that's kind of what I got caught up in. Um, and I had an idea in my head that I could, again, leverage my skills um, into a couple of particular markets that I was thinking about at that point, which I'm not actually in at the moment at all, um, but just kind of leveraging off what I was doing on eBay already. I thought, well, you know what, I, I kind of have got a few high ticket things happening here. I reckon I can sort of take this knowledge, take those products, and launch something kind of around that um and and it it kind of went that way and it kind of didn't in terms of um again those core products that i was sort of selling um and yeah kind of where i'm at now with you know a store that's that's doing really really well um over seven figures um and sort of looking to expand expand out into a couple of more stores this year as well Sweet, sweet. i think it's interesting you i think you both said that Part of part of the reason why you ended up on high ticket dropshipping was how it was sold online. Um, mm -hmm. You know about that, yeah, maybe yeah. easy, maybe lifestyle, whatever, whatever that is. Um, so I'm I'm going to jump ahead here. I mean, this is going to come out through your story. The thing I'm going to jump ahead and just ask the question: Is that the right message? <laughs> is that no? Is that how it worked out? <laughs> no, no, no. Look, absolutely it's, not. <laughs> it's definitely be a lot from of hard the truth. work. Yeah, and and I think everyone who gets into it and kind of realizes how the industry works how high ticket drop shipping works it's a lot of hard work like you know particularly when in those early days when you're getting a store set up um you know even now like um i'm going through a, a quite a big growth phase in one of my businesses now and and you know i'm i'm and i'm still working nine to five i'm hoping to sort of get out of that within the next sort of two to three years um but just to kind of give people a bit of an idea as to the commitment that that I'm making at the moment, I'm not saying this is for 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 everyone and and it's kind of across the board. But you know, it, it's I'm I'm up in the morning at like four four thirty in the morning working on this particular store, writing copy, um, talking to you know um, um, some of the guys that I that I outsource work to, whether it's for copy or marketing or whatever it might be. Um, but there's a hell of a lot of work that goes into 
these stores. And I think a lot of people, the reason why they quit is because, again, they're sold on it being easy and simple. And when they realize the kind of work you have to put into it, yeah. they just quit. Whereas people like, you know, you, John, myself, Tris, we we kind of see the bigger picture and realize that, yeah, you, I do have to put a lot of hard work into it. But I know that if I do that, there, you know, I'm going to be able to achieve those goals that I've set for myself. Yeah. And just on that too, there's also, obviously there's the effort you need to put in to actually get the thing running, right? Just to build it. But then as uh, Blake just pointed out too, there's also all the effort you need to put in to keep it running <laughs> as well. It's not just uh, once it's going, that's it. Just sit back and relax. You need to obviously manage teams and that sort of stuff as well. Um, I think for me, perhaps it also comes down to your personality as well and how you go about managing your own mental health during that whole phase. Cause yes, obviously Blake's doing pretty well with getting up at four 30, doing that work, then working a nine to five and with kids in the background as well. So that's, a, you know, the, the mental factor that plays in is something that people don't consider until they're in it. And that's something that I had an issue with um, a couple of years ago and it really took a toll. Like I was, you know, the whole thing of just, it's a sprint. So the quicker I get there, the quicker I'm free basically. So, you know, putting the massive hours and neglecting other parts of life as well. And that took a huge toll. So it's not a sprint either, which is important to, to know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's a massive thing that I don't think a lot of people talk about um, with, you know, especially when you're early in your entrepreneurial journey, um, you kind of feel like, and, and I mean, I've, this, this was true for me as well in the beginning, but you kind of feel like, you know, there's a race to get somewhere. Or, you know, there's a race to get to a certain point, maybe because somebody else will get there first. You're comparing yourself to other people and how they're going and all of these other things are going on. Um, and, yeah, you, you, it, it is very easy to overload yourself and and, re, and, and burn yourself out. And, and then, obviously, that, that ends up being a reason why a lot of people do drop out. Um, and it's I think certainly for me, and, and I've been doing it for nearly eight years now, I think, um, certainly there was a realization at some point for me that, you know, there's no race, right? You're, you're not in a race. There's no, there's no, um, and it is very important to, um, you know, manage that mental health stuff. I mean, cause I've, I've had the same thing at various points Definitely. as well, for sure. And, uh, now it's kind of like, and I think part of it as well is it, people fall in love with the end point, but they don't realize that they've got to actually love the journey as well. Um, yeah, and the journey is different as well, yeah. right? So every store is different, every business is different, and they all, you know, they develop in over their in their own time as well. Obviously, you can push that forward a little bit, but they have their own sort of cycles. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, totally interesting to hear um, your thoughts on the the ease of high ticket dropshipping and that whole thing. I think something me and Ben say on this podcast a lot is that it's a simple model. Simple business model, but it's not. That doesn't mean it's easy. And I think that's yeah, yeah. the that's the confusion people put in there. It's a business. It's a legitimate business, and like any business, there's in the beginning there's a lot of hard work. And it's interesting yeah. to listen to Blake's sort of time commitment there at the moment, which I think is realistic. Um, but at some point, it does flip. So in our in one of our previous Freedom Friday episodes, we talked to John Murphy, who's been doing it a little bit longer than you two guys. I think he's about two years further ahead of you guys in terms of the amount of time he's been doing it for. And in more recent times, he's been able to flip that back. So he put in a lot, a lot of hard work, same mm. as you guys. But he's slowly over the last couple of years put in place systems to where now he's kind of like 10 yeah. hours a week sort of involvement with his business. And I think that does happen over time. Like you do need to put in a lot of work to drive yourself up into those sort of multiple seven figures a year in annual revenue. they but when you get to there, you start to have the, the money and the cash in the business that you can then reinvest to building some systems and bringing people on and bring that time commitment, start to bring it down over time. Yeah. There's certainly it's that is, balancing act. Yeah. Because obviously you don't want yeah. to get to that point where you're, you're still working in nine to five. You've built this huge business that requires a nine to five to run and then <laughs> you don't have the time to put in the systems. So you need to be, yeah, as you yeah. go, you need to be pretty careful how you do it. But Absolutely. yeah, yeah. Done. There's, there's tools. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of where I'm at now is that phase of building those systems to, to get to that next point where I'm going to be able to take a big step back from the sort of day to day of 
the business. Um, I'm in I'm in a niche that that's quite technical to some degree as well. Um, so that brings about a measure of of having to train up VAs around those technicalities and ensure that they've got, you know, that they're when they're speaking to a customer that they're relaying the right information about particular products and and and, and answering customer questions effectively. So that's kind of where I'm at with my business, with, with my core sort of first store at the moment, um, is sort of getting all that sorted as well. Um, and then from that, and, and we can probably talk about this later on, is is at the moment looking at some of my own branded products as well, which is um, sort of one of the, the, generally seems like the next sort of step is when when someone gets a high ticket dropshipping store and sees a bit of success with it, they start branching out into their own sort of branded products for extra revenue and profit as well. Yeah, yeah, totally. We'll definitely come back to um, to that. That's uh, I'd love to talk some more about that and, and how that's looking. But um, we we'll go back to the a bit earlier on. So you both launched your stores in 2019 on kind of opposite ends of 2019. I want to ask you first, Tris. Do you remember your first sale? Um, I do. <laughs> where, where were you? What were you doing? And and what was it? What what you, I was. How, what was, was the, a was feel at the time? It was a Friday night. So I'd been. I've been live running ads for about two and a half, three weeks. Uh, it was a Friday night and I was actually walking to the pub <laughs> with my girlfriend and walking down the street and I had this cha-ching. I was like, what the heck is that? Like I didn't even I didn't even know the shop until I made that sound, right? <laughs> so I look at my phone and I'm like, Jesus, I got a sale. <laughs> Lost my shit basically. <laughs> But it was um it was like 30 bucks for a little a little <laughs> accessory, like a fitness accessory thing. It was yeah, it was trash, but <laughs> it made no money on it because the shipping cost was more than the cost of the item itself. So I actually lost like 30 bucks on it. But yeah, it was a pretty good feeling, it's for sure. Awesome. Awesome. How about you, Blake? Yeah, my first sale was within the first week of of, of ads going live. Uh, it was a pretty decent sized sale. I think it was sort of just under a thousand bucks. Um, and I remember I was um, I was standing in my kitchen talking to my wife about the website, and similar to Tris, heard this cha-ching sound. I'm like, "What the hell was that?" Uh, on my phone, and sort of picked it up. I'm like, "Oh my god!" I like made a, made the first sale, and um, yeah, the wife and I were sort of jumping up and down because um, she'd seen sort of how much work I'd sort of put into launching this first store, and 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 kind of how long it took me to get going. So sort of having that first sale was that you know first part of that that sort of recognition that what I'd done was was working up to that point. Hey, just want to jump in here real quick and say if you're loving this show, the number one thing you can do to help us out is simply go to Spotify or iTunes or whatever you're listening on and smash that follow button, that subscribe button, and leave us a review. It really does help us reach more people. And if you've got a friend that you know should be listening to this, send the podcast over to them. We'd love to have them join us as well. And real quick, two quick resources I have for you. If you want to join us in our free Facebook group, you can find that at facebook.com slash groups slash dropship tribe or just search the dropship tribe. And we also have a paid version of this podcast where you can get even more of John and I and longer form content. You can find that on Patreon at patreon.com slash dropship podcast. All right, back to the show. Awesome. I love that one. It's it's, it's always something like that. Um, like it just comes out of nowhere and you're like, what? I don't even know what's going on. Awesome. That's so good. Yeah, cool. So you get there and like what, what was your first few months like on your businesses? Because I think for a lot of people, that's really um, one of the, one of the kind of like the the hardest bits at least I, I remember thinking for me it was like i mean i was my first store started super slow like compared to probably even compared to both of yours and i remember it was it was a very lonely time like you get over that excitement of making your first sale or two and then it's kind of like yeah for me it was super slow after that like it my my first store really started slow and then picked up momentum quite quickly you know after a bit of time but um what well, tris what was it like for you in the first few months of running your business first few months were the same for pretty much the whole 2019 it was it was slow the whole time so i think i got that first sale and then i think it would have been about three weeks before the next sale and that second sale was actually decent it was you know several hundred dollars and it kind of ticked along from there and this mix of having at the time i was selling a lot of low ticket stuff as well sort of below 200 bucks mm -hmm. so i was getting these small sales coming through and i was like oh yeah so there's stuff happening and then i get the occasional spike of the big I was like, oh, okay. So it's kind of the the fundamentals were there, right? I was like, okay, well, it's not obviously overnight success, but it shows that people are willing to actually spend money on my store, which is 
that that reassurance was a you know a good starting point and yeah I was I mean I was disappointed um because I was like oh well, I'm supposed to be selling hundreds of these things I'm supposed to be doing really well <laughs> why isn't it happening um so yeah the first the first year was was a struggle to be honest um in that regard just from that mindset of like why isn't this happening quicker um yeah and how did you how did you deal with that like like what i mean because you're still here you're still going um and yeah. I asked you're going through that so, journey and that would be i would imagine and, and i think you know i mean honestly i was partially sold on high ticket drop shipping along the same lines um and i can certainly remember having some sort of a lot of self-doubt at various points early on and, and that sort of thing how did you deal with that yeah so support network right um getting involved with like-minded people in similar situations. So exactly, you know, joining the Facebook groups, um, reaching out to you, John, I think joining um, your previous course, I can't remember what it was called now, but um, Build, Sell, Grow, Repeat and being involved in that community. Obviously, I mentioned before, Blake and I sort of started chatting on Facebook and we were kind of coming up at the similar times and building the stores at similar times. Um, and from there, we've now got, I guess, what you would label as a mastermind type thing of you know, we've got a few people, John Murphy included in um, a Facebook chat and mostly just the Aussie crew. And we just throw around ideas. We throw around successes, um, you know, difficulties we're having. Like I think even Blake, like with the success he's having um, a couple of weeks back, he's like, oh, anyone else got a really quiet week? Like I'm, I'm really quiet. Like what's, what's going on? Is it just me? Um, so even the, the, you know, the roller coaster never ends. There's always these ups and downs. So you always have that, you know, the mental game playing in the background, but yeah. So just bouncing up other people and throwing opinions and ideas around and support. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. How about you, Blake? How was your, what was your early experience? Like, like those first, first few months? Cause I think you might've, uh, <laughs> you might've gone a bit quicker but with the sort of sales growth, I think, didn't you? Yeah. I, I, I had a really great first month which kind of um set me up for disappointment because months two and three i i if i remember i think in the first month i i had something like must have been like five or six sales and i'm like oh, okay this is actually like really working and i was sort of you know pretty excited about it. and then month two and three i i either had zero sales or like one sale over the next two months and that really got me down like i was really basically thinking oh, I'm, I'm going to give up because this isn't working and um you know even though I, I was sort of leaning on like people like yourself Tris, and we had our sort of little mastermind going I was sort of still sort of thinking you know what kind of what the hell am I doing wrong and why isn't this working and obviously things kind of took off um, in about some month four or whatever it was um but yeah th- those early sort of days were um were a bit of a struggle particularly those two months without any sort of sales at all and you know you're still you're still um paying um google you know hundreds of dollars for shopping ads and stuff like that so i was seeing all this money kind of come out of my account but nothing come back in so yeah it was a pretty it was a pretty tense first few months um and then once um i sort of started seeing a few more sales come in kind of in in months four five and six i I actually um, sort of pivoted um, into like I was in like the broader sort of gaming niche and then I pivoted into one particular area um, and that's where things really took off. And the main reason why I did that is because I I think after about month six or seven, I kind of looked at all my sales and where they were coming from and they were coming from this one particular um, area of my my niche. So I, I sort of thought, well, my, my market's basically telling me something here um you know and i'm going to sort of steer it into that particular direction that's when things really just went um nuts again sort of like that next level you know i sort of started seeing a few sales come in and then once i once i pivoted that's when things really took off yeah cool and so what like in a in a sort of physical sense or a, an actual sense what what did that pivot look like like in terms of what did you actually have to do did you like change your website did you just focus how did you focus in more on those categories of or that category of products that was working really well for you? Yeah, it was really just focusing in within that category. So I didn't need to sort of change too much in my store or like, you know, rebrand or anything like that. It was more just seeing what was what was basically selling and then just 
you know, those products that weren't part of that part of that niche, or I couldn't link them to that niche. I basically got got rid of all those, and they weren't selling anyway because again, I was just selling products from this one specific part of the niche that I was in. So I I really just focused in on those categories and and kind of dumped the the products that weren't part of that and just um, focused on that. And that was good for me because it kind of saved a bit of time. I didn't have to deal with um, as many suppliers, as many customer questions, I could just focus in on on the guys that I was actually selling a lot of product for. Um, so it kind of made it easy for me. And and now, and looking at kind of where I'm at now with that particular store as well is that, um, and I I think this is kind of just natural um, for for anyone who's run a store for you know a good couple of years. You you become you basically become an expert within that niche. So you know everything about the product. You know you know. Um, you know all the features, all the benefits, how they work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you kind of start looking for opportunities, like within that niche as well, in terms of okay, well, how can I make more money off this product, or can I bundle, you know, one or two products together and and kind of have something that differentiates me from my competition. And so doing that, making that pivot allowed me to do that as well as kind of start looking at this niche and going right, well, how can I now start making more money in, and uh, from these particular products and and really branch out as well yeah yeah awesome awesome and you you started with a fairly broad store as well tris did you find that you ended up like yeah. focusing in more on certain things after a period of time oh the the initial store that i launched was like vast <laughs> i think i had about five thousand skis at the start I thought, oh. you know within the start the <laughs> first six months um ranging from everything from you know like ten dollar little knickknacks to ten thousand twenty thousand dollar products so the entire range um i just was like oh this this is all stuff that i can sell so i'll just publish all of it um which i mean it took me six months just to upload all that stuff basically like to get that into actual products and images and all that sort of thing um and then yeah so i went along you know, again, it's if you don't what you don't know, you don't know until you've experienced it. So I went along for, I guess, the first six months to a year, and then realized I had all this bloat that wasn't either wasn't selling, or if it did sell, then you'd have all these customer issues, especially with the low ticket stuff. Anything below two hundred dollars, like man, I had so many customer issues, either with you know perhaps it was sizing, or there was a flaw, or the color was slightly off, and it was just this pain in the ass, really, like little stuff that shouldn't really matter but people were bringing up and asking for exchanges and i was like this is not worth the effort <laughs> to be honest so yeah i actually ended up cutting i did actually a couple of culls so i did a huge cull of a whole category of stuff um in mid 2020 and then did another cull fairly recently about probably six months ago i did another cull of products so I focused in on particular i guess smaller categories and focus on that um but again it's that learning experience like okay, figuring out what sells what doesn't and then i guess the second cull was more from the seo point of view of learning like having all these products all these collections waters down the overall site so i was really focusing on trying to build that up and focus the sort of link juice that you took that you talk about in uh, well you know on the on the course and all that sort of stuff yeah trying to really focus that into where it needed to go yeah, yeah, awesome. I think that's a it's, there's an interesting mind shift there, mindset thing there. You know that I think yeah, you, when you're first starting out, you don't really realize, but it's super important to listen to your market, um, mm. but also not like it's okay to like take stuff off your site after you put it on, right? Because I mean, you have to see what sells, and oftentimes your best sellers can be things that you didn't really think they were going to be in the first place. Uh, and I think a lot of people who are earlier on think. Oh, I've got access to all these products, so I'm just going to put them all on, which is not a necessarily an issue, but it's it's okay to take them off at some point as well. Like after a period of time, I think you know, twelve months, twenty four months, whatever. Um, you, you know, you don't want to have stuff sitting there for for years that you never sell, and it's just yeah, taking up space on your site for sure. Yeah, I'd also say you know you can start small and have your core products, and then. Down the line, once you're sort of you've really got the hang of SEO and all that kind of stuff, then when you're looking to expand your store and build it up, you can just target, okay, say this collection of products, which you haven't launched, but they are there. 
and you're having a look at your keyword research or that kind of stuff, you see an opportunity, you can really hammer that and go, okay, we're going to go for this and build up all your, you know, your content around it and blah, 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 and, and maybe kick that off as an extra source of revenue. Um, yeah, you don't have to do everything at once. In fact, don't do everything at once because it's just too much work. <laughs> Yeah, awesome. Cool. So you guys are into sort of like your third year now, I guess, dropshipping. And how did, um, Blake, you you kind of touched on it a bit, um, you know, you, focusing in on those those sort of products was one of the big things that uh, sort of sparked growth in your business. Um, what other things have, do you feel like you've done or, or you've put in place in your business that um, made a big difference to your sales in your sort of in your second year and even into this year as well, your third year? Yeah, um, I think um, one thing is is definitely having really good relationships with your suppliers. So I've got, um, for my biggest suppliers, I've got really strong relationships with those guys. And and I think the reason why that's that that's good and can contribute to sort of helping with sales is that um, particularly with, with my niche in particular, and I'm sure with other niches as well, is that once you kind of know the suppliers, you, you start getting little sort of inside knowledge tidbits and 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 you can sort of start getting feedback from these guys. And and for me personally, like when I was when I'm talking to the, to some of my bigger suppliers, I start getting ideas for you know new products or, or areas I can kind of go into um, and and potentially make more revenue. Um, but having those relationships also helps your business because you know when you need to call in a favor or they you know i've even had suppliers ask me for favors you're kind of there to, to sort of help out um and you know really um help these guys out so for example you know i've had a, a supplier that was um um had a particular product that wasn't doing so well and he's like blake can you try and sell these within your store and and um was able to to sort of sell out this particular product for them um and if you've also got a little bit of particularly with the marketing side of things and this is probably more so from my just my sort of pure background in what i do for sort of nine to five um i've helped a couple of my suppliers with their marketing like i've, I've basically know on certain terms pretty much told them that their their marketing stinks and here you know do this you know do a b and c and it's going to help you out and i've done that and leveraged that into like you know better margins on products and and things like that um so that's sort of definitely one way that's you know, kind of helped with um, the business to a large degree. I think as well. the the supply relationship is really important, and I guess from I guess an extra onto that from my perspective is the suppliers are also looking. So obviously, we're looking to the supplier for information, those inside 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 knowledge. It works in reverse as well. So the supplier is you know a wholesaler, so they're looking at just selling to stores and whatever bulk, um, but they're also looking for the inside knowledge of what do these customer demographics actually look for as well? So that's my experience uh, from a couple of my suppliers is, you know, oh, what's the sort of interaction with customers on this range of products? Like we're looking to import, you know, $100,000 of X into Australia. Um, do you think your customer base would be appreciative of this if we sold it? Like would it actually sell that kind of information? Yeah, I've, I've had a similar situation to Tris as well. I've, I've had a couple of suppliers approach me in a similar sort of vein saying basically we're looking to to sort of you know bring in this particular product um firstly what do you think of the product do you think you'd be able to sell it and how many units do you think you'd be able to sell in like you know six months or 12 months uh and kind of help them out with that as well and and then sort of my you know my my sort of stores become almost like a a sort of soft launch for a couple of these products um and 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 some do well some don't just sort of you know depends on what the market's sort of asking for um, but yeah, I've been able to help out suppliers in, in, in that way. But I think, yeah, again, having that really strong relationship with suppliers, um, is, is a really key advantage. And I, I would even go as far as saying a couple of my, of my suppliers are like friends. Like I chat with them, you know, on a weekly ish sort of basis. And, and, um, we just, we just, you know, just jam about the industry and kind of what's going on and, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's I, I think that's key to, success when you're doing something like this with dropshipping for sure 
hey, if you're a big fan of this podcast, you're likely going to be a big fan of our YouTube channel as well. John and I try to put out a video every week. We do our best, and we'd love to have you over there. You can check it out at dropshipbreakthrough.com forward slash YouTube. Subscribe, check out a few videos, throw a thumbs up on there. Let the algorithm know you want to see more high-ticket dropshipping content from John and myself. All right, back to the show. Yeah, I think that's definitely one of the advantages of high ticket drop shipping compared to other drop shipping is that you actually do have actual relationships with suppliers, you know, rather than just buying your products off some random directory or something like that. And you have that, you know, which is one of the reasons why these sort of drop shipping businesses can actually be long term stable businesses rather than sort of quick burnout businesses. But, um, Blake, you touched on a couple, but boys, having you both said that's something that's helped you, like, do you have for somebody who's a bit earlier in their journey and maybe is just forming those relationships, any anything specifically you would say to people to actually help them foster those relationships? Like, there, is there anything proactively that you do to yep. build those? Well, definitely. You know, you the first thing you do when you're setting up is call a supplier fill out the application, yes, get approved, okay. So products go on the website, but you know absolutely absolutely nothing about you. So a really good way to build the relationship is to actually get on the phone or if you can, maybe go meet them in person if they're in the same city as you and learn about the products, show that willingness to to learn. And they'll, you know, they want they want you to know about their products. They want you to know the ins and outs and so you can sell it, right? So Usually they should be happy to give you that time and then relationship blossoms from there. That would be, if I went back and did it again, that's how I would do it. It took me a long time to learn that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think just, just touching on what you said as well, it's, it's, it's definitely, you know, these guys are in business to, to sell their product. You're in business to, to, to sort of sell their product as well. So if you can come together and work on methods and strategies for you both to, you know, get a payoff in selling more product, then, it's all well and good. So yeah, again, I think definitely um, meeting up with suppliers that are in your that are in your sort of state or whatever it might be. Um, you know, I've done that with several of my suppliers. I've sort of gone down to their head office and had meetings with them and and things like that. Um, it can really help solidify that relationship, and then they're getting a bit of an insight into kind of what you're all about. And I think just in general as well is that. Um, if you can just kind of show how passionate you are about their their product, you don't necessarily have to be an expert on it when you're starting out because you, you might not be. But I think just sort of showing that that sort of passion and and, and kind of talking up what you can do and how you can help them out um, gets them excited, and then hopefully you know again you're able to sort of relay that into more sales coming through the door as well. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I'd I'd even add a third third thumbs up to that one like getting out and meeting your suppliers uh where possible not something you have to do in the beginning to get those relationships but once you start selling some products um i think yeah meeting as many of your suppliers as you can face to face because once again like a lot of the people who try and work with those suppliers won't do that like so for your suppliers actually having an online only seller who actually is a person they can you know say hi to sit down have a coffee whatever um, is a big thing. But even when you're in the phase of trying to get suppliers on board, something that I found out from mine is if you've got some that are a bit problematic over the phone, if you can go and meet, just turn up at their place and introduce yourself and say hi, for me, that actually got maybe on my first business, three or four of my best suppliers, what turned out to be my best suppliers on board because I actually was prepared. They were so surprised when I turned up and said, oh, g'day, it's John from blah, blah, blah. We talked on the phone. Um, I just wanted to come down and say g'day that, you know, that actually got them over the line. And I ended up selling products that a lot of other online retailers or drop shippers weren't, weren't selling just yep. because I actually was the guy that turned up and, and you know, uh, gave them that sort of uh, a, a bit of time and all that sort of thing. And that was... You know, that was that that worked out fantastically for me. And that, that was a big difference to me as well, I think. Um, and you can think about it too from the supplier's perspective. You're dealing with usually an account manager. If it's like a big, a big supplier, they'll have account managers for each state or city or something like that. And that account manager obviously has a career, has bosses, has KPIs that they need to meet. So be able to say to their boss, oh, yep, like I've got, a meet, got meetings lined up and one of those is you. 
you know, that, that shows, you know, initiative and all that kind of stuff. Like he's actually, so it's a good thing for him to, to actually have these meetings and have those discussions and onboard these people. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. That's really cool. So uh, kind of let's um, fast, fast forward a bit. So you've been running your businesses for a few years now um, and you know, we're, we're going to, uh, we're going to get to where that's, where that's taking you at the moment in a minute, but you know, those guys have been doing it for a few years now. Um, if you were talking to like somebody who's, you know, just starting out or even thinking about just starting, um, what what would you, by way of advice, what, what would you say to them? Like, you know, or are there like things that helped you most or something like that? Like what would you, what would you tell somebody, maybe even that starting version of you, um, what, what would you have to say to them? I'll go, I'll go you first, Truth. Okay. Um, I would, so I've, I've heard it a few times and I'm going to reiterate it, um, but start SEO early. <laughs> but there's a caveat to that is, so learn how to do keyword research, um, learn the products that you call products and look for keywords around those core products and then create initial content based on that. So product reviews, your mashups of the 10 best X for Y, those types of things, get that stuff published because not only will that over time pay off, but it's also a really good way to learn your products. And then over time that'll pay off. And if you're not a writer, outsource it. And if you don't have the money to outsource it, pick up a bar job on the weekend and use that to pay for it because you can pay someone five bucks an hour to do it for you. So one hour of work in a bar can pay for four hours of content creation. Like if, if you're in that position, a lot of people are, you know, there's ways and roundabouts. So yeah, I start SEO early. Definitely. Love it. Blake. I'm actually in the same boat as Tris. I, I would definitely say uh, start SEO early. Um, and just, just to kind of add to what Tris was saying, I agree with everything that, that, that Tris said, but just to give some, insight into kind of where Tris and I are at, at the moment with the sort of SEO side of things is that you'll be surprised, particularly if you're in a market where your suppliers and the, the, the suppliers could also be retail facing. So, you know, they're suppliers and also competitors to some degree. Um, you you will generally be surprised at how bad a lot of these companies are with marketing, with content, with SEO. So if you've kind of got that SEO angle with you, if you have if you can leverage that, um, you know, I've got pages that are, uh, that when I first started writing, you know, sort of say content for a collection page, it's it's ranked, you know, with, on page one with probably either zero backlinks or, or bugger all backlinks quite quickly because no one else is, is, is doing anything like that within my niche. So if, if, if you're in, if you're lucky enough to be in a niche like that where your competitors and suppliers and 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 so forth aren't leveraging SEO. Um, you can do quite well quite quickly. Um, so SEO is the, the one big thing. And I know John, you drilled it into us like from day one. Start SEO, start SEO. And of course, we totally ignored what you were saying and just did our own thing. Um, but definitely over the last six months, that's been that's been my focus. Um, and I know it's been Trish's focus as well, and and seeing really good results. Like I know, so just just broadly uh, in terms of traffic now, um, I'm fifty fifty on paid versus organic. So, and that's organic trending up uh, at the moment as well, and that's going to continue. So, um, definitely focus on on SEO. The other thing I, I would like to have told myself back in the day, or anyone else sort of starting out, is don't get involved with any shiny object syndrome. Generally, when you get into high ticket drop shipping, you'll start a store and once you start seeing some success or once you get into that sort of system of how these things operate and how to build a store, it's very, very easy to get caught up into, okay, now I'm going to launch a store in this niche, in this niche, in this niche, in this niche. And I got caught up in it and just and just spread myself way too thin Um and and ended up just just basically you know burning myself out so you know if you're in a store and you're seeing some success just stick with it grow that particular store you know to, to sort of where where you where you think you can sort of get it to and then once you've sort of got your systems in place once you've got a team of 
virtual assistants, once you can kind of step back from the day-to-day of that particular store, then look at launching another store. But yeah, don't try and do everything at once because um, you just you you will totally burn yourself out. Yep. And I guess the <laughs> also don't choose anything with electronics in it. <laughs> Well, yeah. Well, yes and no. I mean, we've had. Well, I mean, the niche that I'm in now, my sort of first door is definitely electronics, and and um, I've seen a lot of yeah. success with that. So I'm fine with that. But there's there's uh, certain elect- niches with electric products that you definitely shouldn't get into for sure. <laughs> nice, nice, good advice, good advice. Cool. So, yeah, you guys have been doing it for a while, and things are going good. And obviously, you you got to know each other through that that journey and which is one of the cool things about uh high ticket drop shipping um particularly if you engage with some of the communities online you, you tend to start meeting people that um and, and those relationships can turn into all sorts of things so for me i mean me and my business partner on this who's on this podcast ben we met via you know a group being in groups of high ticket drop shippers um, and that's turned into all sorts of other things for us outside of just running a high ticket drop shipping business but um you guys uh, have, have got together on something um, and uh, I, yeah. I, I'd love to hear how that, because I, I don't think I've really dived into this in any detail with you previously, but I'd love to hear about, you know, a bit about what, what that is and, and kind of how did that come together for you two? Um, yeah, look, I, how did it first come together? Like, uh, yeah, well, well I'm, I know we sort of reached out on Facebook and we we're just chatting and we were kind of at a similar sort of um, um, place in terms of our sort of first stores. Um, we've also got very similar values. So we, we, we get on really well. We've, we've met in person a few times and sort of things like that. Um, but again, similar sort of values. We've got, um, we've got skill sets that, that we can leverage off each other. Obviously again, my sort of copy and market. Complementary and, skill sets. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and, and Tris is very sort of, you know, data driven analytical from that sort of scientific um, background that he's got so we've got complementing skill sets there that we we um we believe we could sort of leverage into a couple of um high ticket dropship stores which we which we've done so we've got a couple of stores that we're running together now um one in particular is doing doing okay sort of ticking along and and we've we've actually just recently had some some pretty in-depth chats of of um um uh, pivoting that store into a particular area of this niche that we're in now to um Again, the market's telling us something. We're selling, you know, uh, a sort of product vertical a lot, and and not really much of anything else. So we're sort of looking to potentially go into this particular pivoted. Yeah, and basically niche down is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, but then we've also had, <laughs> we've also had uh, another opportunity pop up a little while ago that's turned out to be a bit of a, a nightmare um, scenario for us. And I'm. We, look, we and when I say nightmare, we've not like lost hundreds of thousands of dollars or anything like that. Like it's nothing, it's nothing like that. It's just it's been a bit of a, um, it's been a bit of an experience. I think is is probably the right way to to sort of put it. Where we're gonna we're basically in the stages of closing that particular store down now for various reasons. And I might let sort of Trist take Let's go. Yeah, let's go a little bit more in detail. I mean, it's um, yeah, yeah. We can definitely go into detail. Yeah. Well, Blake. Uh, so it's actually for the other store that we've currently got. Um, Blake was reaching out to suppliers and one brand, one supplier reached back and basically gave us the opportunity to become a distributor of their brand within Australia. Um, and we were looking at it and the products looked amazing, like really nicely sort of created and set up. And, you know, the the whole sort of rose tinted glasses, the, you know, shiny ob- object syndrome took pretty much full control. I guess in hindsight, we should have done a little bit more re- uh, research into it. But yeah, we saw this and we saw the opportunity. And we're like, wow, we can sell this to the whole of Australia. Um, and this, you know, it came like he already had a website set up in Australia. So basically take over the Shopify website, tweak it to our own and off we go. We're, we're golden. Um, so yeah, we started going into that and initially it was, it was pretty good. So we actually had to buy, you know, we're investing, I think, Sixty, seventy thousand dollars in stock, and and then building from there and selling the product. So not drop shipping, actually holding the stock, um, and also dealing with all the warranty and those sorts of things as well. Um, and things went well initially, and then as we sold more product, we started to realize that 
the defect rate on the product, which we had asked about initially with the CEO. He said, oh, yeah, it's, it's pretty low. It's single digits. Went, okay, well, it's still pretty high. We'll see how we go. The defect rate turned out to be about 25 to 30%. Oh. Which is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was a major issue. Um, and then on top of that, these things have got large lithium-ion batteries. So there's the whole freight component around that. Um, and these things, I mean, okay, they're, they're electric skateboards, right? So there's a huge public liability risk there too, um, which we didn't really consider at the start. And then once we started to learn, you know, customers were sending us videos <laughs> of them using these things or videos of them breaking these things and saying, oh, yeah, I just crashed into a car. My board's broken. Oh, we were just like, oh, shit. <laughs> but I mean, like that was, you know, public liability. You can work around that. There's insurances and set up structures and things to kind of negate that. But yeah, the defect rate was brutal, like 30% failure rate of these boards. And the CEO wanted us to have a two-year warranty. It was, yeah, it, we pulled the plug on that pretty quick. <laughs> But um, yeah, yeah. It's, it was shiny object syndrome, right? These things looked amazing, great margins, what seemed like great margins uh, on face value. Not so great once you take care of warranty and labor costs and all that sort of stuff. But <laughs> yeah, so, um, and it's a difficult niche too, right? I mean, it's the whole thing with high ticket drop shipping is you're piggybacking off established brands. This is a brand new brand, less than two years old. Um, no real search volume. So it's just the whole electric skateboard keyword um so the marketing is difficult and then you've got knockoff chinese competitors coming in the market's saturated yeah it's, it's challenging we hadn't really fully considered it yeah i mean and, and we had sort of problems with probably pretty much like every step of of the, the business mm. um logistics were a complete nightmare um we were basically left to kind of almost deal with um the brand's factory um who just wouldn't um basically adhere to our requests in terms of like there's there's sort of certain documentation that you need for these products coming into Australia because they're classed as dangerous goods. The factory basically refused to sign off on documentation to to, to basically that basically um, is certification for these products um, because they themselves were trying to do dodgy stuff by trying to you know get them into certain countries under the radar. Um, it's just like parts or something like that. So mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty much like every sort of step, um, we were sort of hitting um, brick walls, and yeah, it's it's sort of we we decided uh, it's probably going back a couple of months ago now, but um, just decided it just wasn't sort of worth our time, um, and yeah, yeah, not, yeah, with the the defect rate and things like that, and also like just the just the actual market and our ideal customers, we just found that um, the, the 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 customers that were buying these products were. You know, this may sound pretty harsh, but they were just scumbags. Like, just a lot of like people that were just um, had massive expectations with buying these products um, and thinking, uh, you know, um, what our certain expectations are around our customer service. And we're and we're and, and we're good. We'll always get in touch with the customer. We'll always help them out. But there was a couple of you know people that we've had, um, you know, eat like shocking emails with just f f bombs and c bombs and all this sort of stuff through them and you know when like one little thing had gone wrong um and it wasn't just like a one-off customer it was like consistently like we found this sort of whoever you know like the ideal customers and people probably a third board, of customers <laughs> were just shocking um so you know and and i don't like any i don't really want like to sort of see that and i didn't want our staff to see that either so um Again, you know, it wasn't just the product itself. It was just, you know, the customers that we were selling to were a nightmare. Um, the logistics of, of of everything was an absolute nightmare. Um, and then when we kind of weighed it all up, we were just like, this is just not worth it. Like, let's just, just let's just get out of this thing as quickly as we can and and kind of lesson learned and that's kind of it. So we're we're in a fortunate position where we again we we haven't sort of lost any money or anything like that. We haven't made any money either, but um you know it's it's a big lesson learned for us definitely in terms of again that's why i said shiny object syndrome like just avoid it like the plague um and doing a lot more a lot more research i think we went into it pretty bright-eyed 
around this particular niche and, and you know i think you know puffing our chest out going we've done this with our old stores we'll be able to get success with this one and it didn't turn out like that and and i think it, had we done some more research around uh like just was saying the sort of legal side of things with you know people riding these boards and having accidents um but also doing more research on the product itself and also our ideal customer i think think at some point we may have looked at that data and gone you know what's probably not the best idea to get into this thing um but we didn't do that at the start but yeah that's uh, again a big lesson learned for us yeah awesome yeah. I, I think that's a that's a really great great little story and set of lessons there because i think from most people who who are in high ticket drop shipping for uh, at least a, a decent period of time you know two three maybe four years I think those sort of opportunities do come up for a lot of people, like those opportunities to partner up with one of your suppliers or, or even somebody reaches out to you and, you know, buy some products in bulk and, you know, kind of be, you know, maybe responsible for a territory or a country or something like that or, you know, be the sole seller in that in that country. I think those opportunities, I mean, I've had those opportunities and, yeah, it's, I think it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking it's just going to be an extension of like how your existing dropshipping business runs, but I, I do think it's mm. a bit different. And yeah, I think research, research is the key. And and also, if you can finding somebody who's done it before, um, to sort of talk to first about this, um, and sort of say like, what should I be looking out for? You know, like going into that relationship. What's also important brand. is to have your obviously like the first thing you should be doing when you're going into this business is to establish your goals and your values and your i guess mission like what's your what are you hoping to get to whether it's you know having that the freedom right so freedom's a big aspect for a lot of people and don't go into anything that could jeopardize that so that's one of the big reasons that like one of the kickers for us to actually pull out of this as well not you know, aside from all the other things, is the time commitment that we would have to commit to actually get this thing successful and to sustain it was huge. I would have to employ actual staff in Australia full time, uh, plus ourselves, et cetera, et cetera. So it just went completely against our mission, I guess you could call it, right, of having that freedom. So even just based on that, regardless of if it was, you know, the defects were fine and we didn't have supply issues. At some stage, in fact, having those issues happen is a good thing because if we're further down the track, it's harder to extract yourself from that situation as well. So keeping your values in mind the whole time. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a fantastic guiding sort of principle for sure. So I want to change tack a little bit and, and just talk a little bit more about your partnership because I think something else that comes up for a lot of high-ticket dropshippers is um, the – option to team up with somebody else or, or form a bit of a partnership to, to open new businesses or, or run existing businesses, whatever that may be. Um, and that really for a lot of people doesn't end well, to be honest. I've, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people where that didn't work out just because it, it sounded like the partnership was a good idea from the outside, but when they actually went into it, you know, obviously there was probably a mismatch in, in various things. Um, you touched on it a bit earlier that Blake, I think that you guys have sort of some shared values and, you know, have similar thoughts about a lot of things. But in an ongoing sense, I mean, you've been doing that for a little while now. You've gone through a rough patch with some of that, obviously, with this, you know, with these electric skateboards that didn't work out for you and you'd put, you know, quite a bit of money up front on that. Um, what do you think has, you know, is, is there anything, sorry, aside from having those shared values, which I think is very important, is there anything else that's kind of led to your partnership in business being successful at this point or, or any advice you'd have for people who are thinking about going into something like that, that they want to sort of keep in mind to have a, you know, a, a partnership that works in an ongoing basis. Yes. I think the values is, is, is definitely one thing. Like I said before, Tristan and I've sort of got, you know, basically the same sort of core values around why we were, why we were in this sort of drop shipping, high ticket drop shipping um, side of things and, and sort of launching these businesses um, and, and again, complementing skill sets too, um, which obviously helps as well. I think, um, I think, just off the top of my head, I, I I believe we've got sort of similar temperaments too. I think if you get 
you can get really caught up in the emotional side of this sort of thing as well. Like, you know, we've, we've just gone through, you know, I'll, I'll say it right here, we've just, you know, a business has basically failed. Um, you know, you could basically get caught up in the, in the emotion of that kind of thing happening and throw your arms up and say, bugger this, I'm going to, you know, leave this partnership or I'm going to, you know, take the money out and, and just sort of do a runner or whatever it might be. But Again, I think just basically because we've got a, a similar sort of temperament going into this thing, and we know we know what sort of running a, a high ticket dropshipping store is all about. And you know, even though we were a little bit sort of again starry eyed going into this sort of electric skateboard thing, that we at the end of the day we both sort of look at it and go, well, you know, like we'll we'll, we'll just get out of this thing and we can launch another store, and 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 you know maybe that'll be successful. And, and and yep. things like that but we we also had our our initial store that we started a while back um that again is still ticking along we'd probably be doing a lot better now i think if we hadn't had this whole electric skateboard thing kind of blow up because we a lot of attention kind of went from that initial store that we launched into this other electric skateboard business um but that store sort of still ticking along so i think yeah i i, I think just going back to your question definitely that that we have, we've sort of got the same kind of temperament we didn't get caught up in the emotional side of things which i think can be very easy to get caught up in um i think um uh, because we've known each other for such a long time and i mean we we are mates right but we're not going into this as you know besties that are just teaming up like oh it's got a great idea let's partner up it'll be fantastic um we've had these experiences of you know the whole the last two years we've been sharing difficulties successes ideas helping each other get through things so we've really learned how each other's minds work in that sense of being under pressure or having that indecisiveness and then so coming together obviously you have the complementary bits and pieces but we have this understanding of how the how each of our minds actually work so we're not coming in as like a oh yeah we'll partner up because you're successful but we don't actually understand how each of us work in a business sense so the fact that we do have that has given us a strong foundation. And it's also good to point out that through this whole process with the skateboard store, we've had massive dramas through the whole thing with that and obviously eventually decided to shut down. But through that whole period, not we didn't argue once about anything. We were on the same page the entire way through that, which even without saying anything, we, we would mess each other and say, I've got this thought. And the reply back would be, I have ha I'm having exactly the same thought at the same time. So we were on the same page throughout, which I think is just, just that is pretty impressive. And then we also came at it from, you know, we gave it a shot, gave it a good shot and we'd learned a heap from it. So I think that's a takeaway that we've, that we've got from that. Yeah. 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 Cool. Cool. Yeah. I think for certainly one of the things you touched on there that I, I think is important that I would give as advice to people is probably don't, uh, the opportunities come up, but don't go, don't don't form a partnership with somebody who's a complete stranger to you. You know what I mean? Like, I, and I've done this, right? I've done this. I've I've been like somebody I've met, I hadn't known for very long. That this was going back years, and they were interested in doing something, and I thought that sounds like a good idea. Do you want to partner up on it, right? And not really knowing them that well, um, and I've done that a couple of times, and it just backfired every time. Um, whereas the best partnership that I have, which is my current one with Ben. Um, on this podcast and dropship breakthrough and, and whatnot that we do there. Like before we went into that, we'd known each other since like 2015, I think. Uh, and we just did that last year. So that's like five years. So, um, and I think by that point, we, yeah, same thing, same thing as you guys. We knew each other's values, you know, we, we know where each other's buttons are, I think, and all this sort of thing. And, uh, how to sort yeah. of manage that relationship. So it's not to say that you need to have known each other for five years to go into a business partnership, but you've got to, I think, I think you've got to spend some time actually just getting to know someone. Like You need to know what's going on behind yeah. the scenes as well with each other's families and the yeah. long-term goals and those values too, not just business values, but actual family values as well. Yeah. Because if it doesn't go well, partnerships are one of the hardest things to unpick. You know what I mean? Particularly if you get down the track a bit with a business that's actually doing well, like getting back out of that can sometimes be a bit bit of a nightmare. So, yeah, 
getting getting to know each other first, I think, or having the ability to, I think, is a big thing for successful partnerships, um, or or to enter into the right one. That's awesome, cool guys. So, how, what's going on now, Blake? Earlier on, we mentioned that uh, we were talking a bit about uh, you know putting your own brand of products out there or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. How's that looking for you? Like, what's what's going on there? Yeah, good. So I'm I'm in the midst now of just um, testing out a couple of products um, that I plan on um, launching uh, a couple of stores for. So what I'm going to do is is, is basically um, once I'm satisfied that these kind of products are, are what I want and what I'm thinking of and and meet the the marketplace's sort of needs as well, um, I'll, I'll sort of soft launch them in in my current store um, and sort of see how they go there because there's obviously you know very minimal cost doing that. Um, the longer term plan is to then kind of um, um, launch um, websites, so like you know Shopify stores for those particular products as well, and kind of have my own brand. So I've got I've got ideas for two stores that are sort of um, along that line. Um, I won't be launching anything till probably either later this year or sort of early in 2023. Uh, but again, I want to soft launch them on my on my current store because they're, they're again they're in they're within the same niche. So see how that goes um and then yeah look basically basically go from there is then launch those new stores and then um hopefully they they'll keep on ticking along and and um it'll be good to have my own again my own sort of brand where um it's not just just drop shipping everyone else's products it's my own gear and my own products well cool. so a few quick questions for you i mean we mentioned this earlier that this is this is definitely an avenue that becomes available to any high ticket drop shipper is you know, once you've built a, a, a reasonable business drop shipping, you, you always have avenues to then introduce your own branded products in that you get manufactured or um, or private labeled or whatever it might be for you. you. You might hold stock in a warehouse, all that sort of thing. Um, and uh, so uh, are we talking, are you doing your own version of your higher ticket products or are we talking about sort of accessory type add-on products here? Um. Definitely, sort of not not accessories per se. Um, they are sort of going to be core product lines. If I if I decide to kind of go ahead and and, and launch the, the sort of own store for these products, look, I may get them and set them up in my store. And the soft launch that I've got in my store now might just totally die in the ass, and I might just end decide not to not to run these products at all. But they are certainly going to be core product lines, um, not accessories. But in saying that. Um, I've got plans to kind of launch complementary accessories for these particular products too that will um, be able to, um, you know, uh, fit some of my supplier products. So I'm I'm basically going to be building products that that um, that will be mine, and then we'll be able to, um, again, through particular accessories that I want to launch, will be able to fit onto supplier products. So um, it's it's definitely a big. Um, it's definitely a big job because again, it's you know you're importing your own gear and um, although I've already got my own um, third party logistics center that that holds a little bit of stock from my current store, um, but so I've got those guys organised in terms of the logistics side of things. They'll be obviously sending out the product to customers, um, but yeah, it's 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 a big job. It's there's a lot of planning, and that's why I'm not even really thinking about it until the end of this year to sort of into early 2023 because. I want to have the time to be able to test these products, soft launch them in my current store, and really get data on kind of how the, these products are tracking before I dedicate um, the resources and time to launching um, independent stores for these products too. Because that, in and of itself, as we all know, is is a massive, massive job. So, um, yeah, that's what I'm sort of looking at at the moment. Um, I'm also looking at another um, distribution opportunity. So I've had a, a company reach out to me um although it's still a little bit of shell shock from the from the skateboard and the skateboard stuff um but i'm i'm sort of in talks with these guys at the moment um again going into it with what i've kind of learned the lessons learned from the skateboard side of things is that i'm i'm going into a lot more knowledge now about um what i'm looking for and kind of how i would set that up um again it would mostly the way i'm kind of seeing it in my head now is it'll be a soft launch on my current store um but they're looking for me to basically take over the australian version of their website and things like that so um 
that's more of, a, again, another one of those sort of longer term um, business ideas that may come about, but may not, just see how we go. Um, but yeah, so with that side of things, in terms of branded products and distribution, it's really it's really sort of busy at the moment. And there's a lot going on in that space for me personally with this with this current store. Mm, cool, cool. So on those product brands that you're launching, are you um, those products that you're going to be soft launching on your store? Are those products that you're sort of private labeling from out of an existing manufacturing line, or are you sort of getting them built specifically? Yeah, more more sort of a white more sort of a white label um, and also leveraging existing products that I've got in my current store. They're, they're, both of these products are basically extensions of products that I've already got. So it's kind of like um, uh, I'll be creating basically bundles. So bu- like a bundle product where, you know, one particular part of this bundle is my product and the rest of it will be existing supply products that I'm kind of rebranding as my own my own kind of products um, as a whole. So um, that's what I'm going to be doing for both of those both of those stores. So kind of white labeling, bundling. Um, mm-hmm. I hope that answers. I hope that answers your, your question. If that no, it does. Sense. Yeah, totally. And how did you how did you uh, find the the manufacturer there for your for your stuff? Yeah, good good question. So so I think going back a step further is it was more about listening to kind of um what my what my market wants and and identifying a couple of gaps within the market that i believe that if i found the right manufacturer or the right supplier i could fill that gap pretty effectively so i i've i've um i've sort of seen these gaps and then gone right well like now i'm going to start sort of talking to a couple of people that i think will be able to help me with this um and basically just put, put the feelers out did uh, heap of research um, on on manufacturers and suppliers. Um, uh, one of these particular um, one supplier that I'm getting product from is in, based in the US. The other one's based out of Hong Kong. Um, so just and just long discussions with these with these guys. You know, this is kind of what I'm looking to do. Are you able to help me with this? Um, you know, then obviously uh, you know talking to them about wholesale prices and things like that. So it, it's probably been for one particular product line, I reckon I've been talking to these guys for probably a good three or four months uh, and and researching their competitors and kind of, you know, matching them up and seeing who I think's got the best combination of, of sort of value and product quality and now starting to get in the first sort of lot of samples to kind of test those products. And then if I'm satisfied with that, that's when I'll start um, looking at more of that sort of soft launch aspect of it and seeing, um, you know, putting in, in place the sort of system to be able to do that as well oh awesome man that's awesome cool tris what's on your radar coming up what are you what are you planning what are you looking forward to uh doing a big focus on seo um back in december i would say i probably spent the entire month doing keyword research to the exclusion of everything else um and mapping everything out, not just doing keyword research here and there, but actually coming up with, so I created a list of 300 keywords that are around my core products, looking at the, you know, keyword difficulties, sort of the backlink quality, um, search volumes, all that kind of stuff, and then grouping like-minded keywords around each other. And now slowly starting to initiate this content production system um and that's yeah i'm pretty much focusing on that so i kind of identified i'm in an uh an ultra i'm in health and fitness um niche in australia which is ultra ultra competitive especially after covid it's just ridiculous i see probably a dozen new competitors popping up every three months i'd say there's hundreds of competitors i don't know how they make any money (laughs) to be honest but they all do the same thing they just pop ads up on google ads and that's it. Um, and they rely on a lot of them are brick and mortar. So they rely on foot traffic through the door. And yeah. so I was doing keyword research and like it, it's, well, I think it's going to be a gold mine. Um, I've got, you know, speaking with obviously your content, um, speaking in detail with John Murphy, he's been a pretty good mentor um, for me and Blake and also speaking mm-hmm. with Blake about content on this sort of stuff for the last sort of six months. Um, I've got a really good strategy that I think will work which will, I mean, it's already forexed my organic traffic over the last three months. And I'm pretty keen. I think I'll be able to see that 20. So that forex would then 20x, um, hopefully by the end of the year. 
Um, so I think the opportunity is pretty massive that I've that I've got there. So I'm really focusing on that. Um, and hopefully, if it all plays out by the end of this this year, um, I should see sort of thirty thousand visits a month organically, which would be very nice. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's the plan. Is I mean, I guess on the side of that is the Google ad space is ultra competitive um, for a lot of brands, and yet the the SEO organic side of it is more or less untouched. So really focusing on that. Yeah, same for my niche as well, John. Is, is yeah, SEO is just basically untouched. So I've um, just um, when I started to focus on SEO for this for this gaming store, um, um, hired a, like an uh, Indian SEO agency, which and they, they've they've done, done relatively well in terms of getting to me to sort of where I am now. Now I've just recently sort of closed my contract with those guys, and uh, I've got a, a good friend of mine um, in Sydney who's got his own sort of small SEO agency, uh, and I'm now sort of working with him um, to, to to really ramp things up from an organic perspective. Um, so I just started working with him oh, two weeks ago. So now we've kind of, similar vein to Tris, kind of mapped out um, everything from a keyword perspective, but also for the content that we're going to start um, launching. I've already got a heap of collection content that's already ranking quite well, but it's making changes to that, bulking some of it up and and starting to get some really high quality backlinks towards that content as well um, to, to really, yeah, start um ranking higher for for some of the sort of key products that i've got yeah awesome awesome fantastic tris uh i i agree i mean i think seo if you're in a if you're in a super competitive market seo for most people is usually one of the one of the things you can use as a competitive advantage is is there anything else in your experience because i know we'll have listeners who are also in competitive markets whether it's in australia or over in the us or, or another country any other tips you've got for people that, that you think have helped you um get a bit of an edge or, or maybe a point of difference or whatever in your in that market uh so i mean as so i guess our partner store is a good example of this it's in a um, a broad, ultra competitive niche as well. <laughs> um, You're sucker for punishment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But um, again, so looking at your, you know, review your your product sales and try and see if there's any categories of products within that that you can niche into. Um, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Um, you know, swings and roundabouts. Um, but then also, you know, the, just having that content there is that alone is more than most competitors will ever do. Um, and especially, you know, everyone's targeting the Google ads, which is bottom of funnel. There's a limited amount of people there and the ad costs just go up and up and up, especially after COVID with the, you had a big spike in sales and then across the board, across the industries, right? And then you also had the slump behind that. So companies are trying to sustain that revenue by spending their way out. Um, so just having the content and targeting that mid funnel Yes, you can target that, you know, the top of funnel as well, but I'd probably focus on the mid funnel. Having those product reviews, the comparisons, the, you know, best 11, your listicles, all that kind of stuff. That's that's key. And then having a really a really good backlink strategy or have a really good agency to support the backlink strategy, I think is good. Um, the mistake that me and Blake both made, well, initially it was fine, but as you go on, it becomes more of an issue is, picking an, an agency and a lot of the backlinks are subpar quality, the sort of link farms, all that kind of stuff, which is really common. If you don't know what to look for, you don't know what you, you're getting. And it took us, what, a year to really see that. Um, but having good quality backlinks would be key as well, especially with ultra, with the competitive keywords. Yeah. Yep. So let, let's... the question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Just uh, an add-on question there, of course, because I know it's going to be on people's minds hearing you say that. When you're uh, assessing a, a potential somebody to work with to help you grow your backlinks, what do you look for, or, or what, what do you what what do you see that might tell you to avoid a potential candidate for that? Uh, I think you want to get proof of of how they're how they're collecting backlinks. You want to see either you know via a, uh, you know one of their current clients. You know, it doesn't they don't just have, to have to name the client, but you want to kind of see what the backlinks look like. Um, you know, and you can look at a a simple sort of program like Ahrefs. You know, if they sort of give you the 
the name of this particular website or client, whatever it might be, you can quickly assess what the quality of the backlinks are like. But just also flatly asking them, you know, if you've got a bit of knowledge, um, and this is probably where where we, again, Tristan and I went into it, not really knowing um, what the quality of these backlinks would sort of look like, but just just ask them, you know, where are you getting backlinks from? You know, what's the sort of the DA and the DR of, of these backlinks? And, you know, do you use PBNs? And just flatly asking them some some pretty simple questions and then, then you you can pick up pretty quickly if they're they're either a you know talking crap that they do use that stuff when they're saying no, um, or you know they may not just know really what they're talking about and and you you just know they're following a system of you know basically here's the you know PBN networks that we're using and go and just get a shitload of backlinks from there and point them to this sort of website. So uh, I think it's pretty easy once you've got a little bit of knowledge about what a backlink is, how it works, and how important it is. Um, to really hit these companies up and say, well, like, show me proof of, of you know, what your backlink strategy is and, and how you're going about it. I think you can, I think, well, yes, you can ask them, but uh, personally, I go into the actual detail. So I'll ask them for, you know, what are your, the same niche or just websites in general, chuck those into Ahrefs, go and have a look at their top pages or collection pages, whatever it is. And then go into the backlinks and actually look through the backlinks. Go to mm-hmm. those websites and see what other content is on those websites. Because a lot of people, go, oh yeah, PBNs, you know these link farms, but they don't know what that looks like. How do you identify that? So essentially, if you go into the, to that backlink website and you're seeing, okay, there's my link on this page, and then you go back and have a look at the blogs or the other content posted, and it's just a mashup of everything under the sun. <laughs> that is a link farm, and that is. The garbage link basically yeah. um so yeah you you do have to do you, you can ask and a lot of the time i think you'll also get the response of oh you know we, we we're really good we follow white hat and they'll just throw white hat up there it's like this is what we do so we're good don't just trust us but to actually look and understand you can also trial them too right a lot of these are sort of month to month plans or you don't have to you know commit to an annual plan or anything mm-hmm. like that so you can trial them for a couple of months see what the backlinks they're generating are like um and then bin them or talk to them and say look these this is subpar content we don't want that go from there yeah yeah awesome great advice great advice all right fellas look i want to uh, i want to wrap this up by asking you just just a, a a fairly simple question but uh obviously we get a lot of people who listen to our podcast uh, who might be listening in right now a lot of drop shipping that uh gets talked about online is, is, is based around the U S market. Um, you're both obviously, uh, like me, Australian. So a country with a much smaller population and presumably a much smaller market of customers. Um, you're making it work. Uh, so clearly it's working for you. Uh, any, any advice or thoughts you'd pass on to somebody else who's thinking about, um, or either is, you know, doing, doing it in a smaller country like Australia or maybe the UK or Canada or somewhere like that? I would say, <clears throat> sorry, I would say probably, for, I, I'm, I haven't obviously haven't had experience, but I would say that you're probably generally restricted to countries that are English speaking, first off. I think you would struggle with countries that are, you know, different languages. Um, I think there's issues around that. And those countries would generally be smaller as well. Maybe, you know, say Germany might be one that you could do, but yeah. Um, And then also like, yeah, UK definitely works. I know people in the UK that have been dropshipping successfully. Um, Australia definitely works. Um, The issue with Australia is that the population bases are quite spread out. So the, the heavier your products are, the more expensive freight becomes. And that can be an issue, especially with regional areas. Um, yeah, I think drop shipping is definitely alive and well in the US for sure, Australia for sure, the UK for sure. Any other countries, I I, I don't know. I'd be, actually be keen to hear about people drop shipping in other countries um, with different, you know, there's the language barriers, translations, what SEO looks like in those countries would be interesting. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, boys, thanks for uh, jumping on today. Uh, I think that's that, that was a great sort of journey through uh, the experience of high ticket dropshipping, but also a, a very realistic one too. Um, but not regarding the work involved and that sort of thing, but also you know some 
you guys are working on some great stuff, which I think really highlights uh, what opportunities can come up for you um, as you go through your your high ticket dropshipping journey uh, and the different things that will come across your path. And in fact, you know, there, there's a whole, um, you know, doing it and practicing it opens up whole other worlds for you, which, um, you know, other business opportunities, um, developing your own brands. And it's not just about you have to stick with high ticket dropshipping. So thanks very much for sharing your stories. Thanks, John. Happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Thanks for listening to the Dropship Podcast. You can find all the show notes for this episode at dropshippodcast.com. And if you're ready to take the next step in your dropshipping journey, we invite you to join us inside Dropship Breakthrough, where John and I will walk you through step-by-step in starting your own high-ticket dropshipping e-commerce business. But that's not all. Dropship Breakthrough will also teach you everything you'll need to know to grow your business and take it to the next level. So head over to dropshipbreakthrough.com and sign up for our free training that will help you take the first steps towards building and growing your own profitable high-ticket dropshipping business.